Good afternoon. Welcome to The Double Life of Catherine Clark with Catherine Gregorio. We are delighted to offer this program on International Women's Day. Our program today is presented jointly by the Pritzker Military Museum and Library and the International Spy Museum. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education at the Spy Museum in DC. My friend and colleague, Liz Aberline, Associate Director of Programs at the Pritzker Military Museum and Library in Chicago, will be leading the conversation with Katie today. Katie was inspired to write this really fascinating book, The Double Life of Catherine Clark, as she learned more about her extraordinary great aunt, who is the subject of the book. Katie is a first time author who leveraged her degrees in history and international relations to unravel this compelling and globally wide ranging Cold War story. Now, before I turn this over to Katie, just a reminder, you are invited to post your own questions through the Q&A. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible also. This program is being recorded and it will be available for streaming on both the PMML website and the Spy Museum YouTube channel very soon. One last important thing, we wanna thank the Pritzker Military Foundation for their generous support of this program on behalf of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. Now, over to you, Katie. Thank you, Amanda, for such a kind introduction. And it is really exciting to be here today. Um, I actually met my husband about 20 years ago at a Spy Museum event. So it is a very special um, moment for me to be able to be here with everybody. Uh, I also wanna echo your thanks for the sponsorship from the Pritzker Military Foundation and thank all of you for taking time out of your day to attend and learn more about what I think is truly a fascinating story. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today on International Women's Day during Women's History Month to celebrate almost a year of my book, The Double Life of Catherine Clark Being in the Wild. <clears throat> the book is truly a Cold War adventure story full of intrigue and revolutions and secret spies, but it also at its heart explores two important themes. The first one is a woman making her way in a man's world. And the other one is really about friendship. And it asks the question, what would you do for a friend? While I was writing this book and doing the research for it, <clears throat> I constantly had to remind myself it, that in the 1930s and 40s, when my great aunt was first getting started in journalism, that it was pretty unheard of for a woman to be working outside of the home. And if she was working outside of the home at a newspaper, she likely was working on the society page. She certainly wasn't covering global events or going um, and living abroad and covering boots on the ground revolutions um, for readers back home. And a large part of why my great aunt was able to have the life she had was because she grew up in a military household. You can see her in this image on the left, um, wearing her military kind of reporting uniform. And then in the 1940s, early in the early 1940s, she um, and her son moved to Panama to live with my great grandparents for a time. My great grandfather was in charge of the anti-aircraft um, defense of the Panama Canal, and he had his men go up into the jungles in Panama. And in order to keep them engaged um, on their radios and make sure that they were tuning in for their um, for their lessons and drills. Um, a group of his men came up with the idea to read the news and to play music. And my great aunt at the time joined in and it gave her the foundation to then parlay an opportunity in Ohio and then at WCAU in Philadelphia to become a broadcaster. And she was covering um, the news for children and women and in 1945 was given the opportunity to go to Berlin. And she was one of the first journalists in post-war Berlin and the first woman to broadcast out of Berlin. And that experience, which was enabled by the military, she was um, accredited by them, um, really formed 
um, her perspective and view on the world. And because she was a woman, she was able to bring um, a different perspective. Also because she was a mother, she was able to bring a different perspective. And you can see this in how she covered um, down the road when she and my great uncle were stationed in Greece and then eventually in Yugoslavia and other places, the revolutions and, and the experiences she had, she talked about it from the view of a mother. There was one report where she talked about how um, the government of Poland had said that no children had died in an event. And she had gone out and talked to um, parents who are at cemeteries and was able to bring that story back to readers um, in the United States. And it really helped bring a different lens on what she was experiencing in Europe at the time. And it was also this perspective, her experience and you know, being a woman that led her to a moment in Belgrade um, where she was covering a trial of Neil von Gilas. He's the gentleman who is pictured with her on the right, um, who at the time had been the vice president of Yugoslavia. He had been a very prominent member of the communist party in the country, had helped build it, had helped form it. Um, went to Moscow on several occasions and met with Stalin. And, um, and then in his thinking, he was an intellectual, started to see after the war and after the revolution that communism wasn't necessarily paying off on all the promises that it claimed to deliver. And he started thinking and he started writing and she saw in him ideas that she thought were incredibly important, not only because of who he was, but also because of what he was saying. And she decided that she wanted to work with him. And she had a lot of obstacles in the way to work with him. First and foremost, he first wanted to work with her husband because he worked for time and he wanted to have some of his articles covered in life. But then also just you know figuring out how to work with him because his apartment was bugged and they couldn't work in his apartment. And so how she could get him to work with her um, and tell his story. Um, he spoke English, but it was by no means his first language. And so the way that they ended up working together is he would speak and she would write on her typewriter while, you know, water was pouring out to make sure that nobody could listen in from all the faucets that they had in their small little um, apartment in, Bel in Belgrade. And as she worked with him, she also took on more and more responsibility to get his stories to the West, either through friends who were traveling from the embassy past the censors or on her person um, at certain times. And then um, fast forward, uh, there were some developments where he was actually put in jail. She and my great uncle had moved to Vienna and she took on the management of bringing a lot of the papers that had had come out of the country that he had written and really crafting them and making sure that they got into publication in the form of books um, and articles. And at different moments in time, she really put her life on the line to make sure um, that his ideas were not only heard, but heard in a big way and with a big platform. And, um, you know, I started this off saying that this was really about a Cold War adventure story that explored what it was like to be a woman's in a man, man's world, but also kind of what would you do for a friend? And um, I wanna just end with a brief um, excerpt from a letter that he wrote to my great aunt right after he got out of his second stint in prison that I think encapsulates the really deep bond that they had um, and developed over their time working together. Um, and uh, bear with me as I just um, bring up the letter. So, my gratefulness to you has no limits, just as your friendship towards me. Yet between us, something much stronger than gratefulness and friendship has been created. Our destinies have become identical. The lightest and the hardest moments of my being are unbreakably tied to you. Time and space are not able to weaken our relationship. What is more, it is being purified and made eternal by distance and years. My memory will always be guarding you and my hopes will be within you. We are hoping that we shall meet, even if that is not to be soon. I understood Catherine very little over the telephone so that we hoped you would come here after Washington. Now we are awaiting Sandy, who's her son, as a part of you and so dear to us that it seems you are coming. We hope you will find more peace and quiet at home 
for you have too, in a different way to us, had to part from the normal life conditions and sacrifice a lot for unpersonal ideals and duties. But that is how it should be with all who live, not just for themselves and their time. With all of our beings, we would like to return to you something great and unforgettable. For when we note down so many of our friends, you with your unselfishness and loyalty occupy a special place. And with that, I'm excited to extend the conversation um, about the double life of Catherine Clark. Uh, hello, Katie. Um, happy International Women's Day. Uh, what a perfect way to spend the day with, with this story. So we're so excited to have you. Um, I, I kind of want to start um, the conversation with this family connection that you have to Catherine and this story. Um, so Catherine is your great aunt. Is this story something that you grew up hearing as a kid? Is this kind of like the legend of your great aunt, Catherine? Or um, is this something that you kind of found out later in life as you were growing up and, and kind of heard? Um, and then kind of on the other side of that, does writing about a member of your family change the responsibility that you feel to, to get it right, to get the story right? Absolutely. Happy um, International Women's Day to you as well. So um, I am actually named after my great aunt. And so when I was growing up, my mom is kind of the historian for the family. She's the storyteller. I always paid attention to stories about her. And there was this vague story that my mom kind of knew about, about her smuggling out papers in her bra, which was one, a cool story. And also just, you know, random. Um, and so I, you know, I knew about it, but I didn't really give it much kind of credibility or, or like thought until I was in the basement of Georgetown University and I was doing um, some research for a master's um, that I was pursuing at the London School of Economics. And I ran into a friend from college and saw a plaque out of the corner of my eye. Um, I was, you know, if you can imagine, it was back when, when newspaper articles were on microfiche and I was uh, kind of going and rolling through to, to do some research. And I saw the name and I, you know, registered that it sounded like my great uncle. And when um, I got home, um, I grew up in DC. My parents lived there. Um, I asked my mom about it and she was like, yeah, you know, he went back to, to Georgetown. And then I went and just kind of went down the rat hole and discovered so much about the story. So there was a kernel that I knew, but I had no idea how impactful it was. And then I just couldn't get the story out of my head. Um, and as, you know, to answer your second um, question, as I thought about this, um, there is, um, you know, that personal connection that you really want to bring in. You want to be true to the research. Um, but telling a family story is um, very interesting when you've met the person. So she passed away when I was eight and I have special memories of her, but also because she had different interactions with different members of my family that I was very fortunate to be able to interview for the book. So my uncle and my aunt each spent time with her in different settings. My uncle in Berlin, um, when she, she and my great uncle had lived there. And then my mom in DC, when she would come home to visit her mother. Um, and I'm not sure that I told the story any different, but I felt that I had special access that one might not have if it wasn't a family member. And part of that is also because of the generational, you know, it wasn't such a long ago story to be able to go pursue. Um, so when you and you and I were talking um, in preparation of, of the program, you mentioned that the two photographs that you showed are the two photographs that you that you have of Catherine. Is that all that all that exists, you know, kind of that that connection? So that, unfortunately, um, are the only good ones that I have. There were a series of pictures that were taken in the early 1980s that have that, you know, brownish orange tint that only, you know, <laughs> antique photos um, have, and they just didn't show up very well. But she was very um, active in my life in a way that a great aunt would be. Um, and I actually never met her sister, who is my grandmother. And so she... Um, did write me letters and gave me books with inscriptions um, and shared specific books that were important to her and my grandmother growing up. Um, but she didn't, she wasn't as involved in my life as a, as a grandparent might be. And so, yeah, that's all that, that I have to actually visualize what she looked like. Um, it's unfortunate because she really was a remarkable woman. Um, I, I know kind of that kind of going back to what you were saying before, having 
this as a personal connection and a family member really kind of lends itself to having these these personal stories. Um, and when you notice the plaque in Georgetown, that's not a story that I, that I knew. When you notice that plaque in Georgetown, um, did you know that plaque was there? Is that just kind of something that you happened to be in the basement and you just looked up? It feels like it was something that's kind of meant to be. You know, in, in many ways, I think it was. No, I didn't know that. So the quick story was my great aunt and great uncle had a whirlwind romance. They found themselves pregnant their senior years at Smith and Amherst. And back then, um, those schools didn't allow uh, their students to be married and they got married. So they had to, to leave school and then they pursued journalism in various cities during the Great Depression. And so my great uncle decided to go back and finish his degree because he was three cre credits shy um, in the 1970s when he was much further advanced than a typical college student would be. And it was through that that he decided to leave reams and reams of papers um, that were the foundation for being able to write this book. If that had, if my great aunt had not had the foresight to keep those papers, and if he had not donated them, this book would not have been able to be written. Um, I, I think that's kind of such a wonderful kismet moment, you know, where where you kind of stumble upon this and and kind of even further that that family connection too. Um, I, I want to, you know, especially with this being Women's History Month, International Women's Day, I, I want to kind of focus a little bit on um, Catherine herself. She's the first female American wire reporter behind the Iron Curtain. She's the first um, accredited female military um, war correspondent. Um, could not have been easy on her, um, you know, at this time. Can you set the scene a little bit? You, you talked about it a little bit in your, your introduction, but can you set the scene with Catherine a little bit in the context of the time um, and her struggle to find her place in this male dominated world? Um, and especially this relationship that she has with her husband, because her husband is also, um, you know, a reporter and, and he, you know, like you said, Gilas really wanted to talk to him. Um, so can you set that context a little bit in, in the scene of the story? Yeah, I mean, I think over and over again, being a woman was a little bit of a handicap for her. And instead of succumbing to kind of the obstacles that were put in her way, I almost think of her as being like a, you know, a burly mule of just having to kind of like push through those obstacles in order to achieve what it was that she wanted. So there are a couple of examples um, that I can share throughout time because I think it was very contextual and it also depended on the availability of men. So during the war, she actually um, didn't have as many obstacles as she did after the war because many men were off abroad fighting. Um, but there were two stories that that really stuck with me as I did the research. The first one was actually, so I mentioned they dropped out of school, they moved to New York City, they moved to upstate New York, and then moved to St. Paul, Minnesota. And at the time um, that they were in St. Paul, the police force was very corrupt. And there was a, an incident where um, my great uncle was had to go on the air. And so he called Catherine to help him track down a story. Somebody from John Dellinger's gang, gang had been um, killed. And there was um, a story that she she pulled on when she went to go to the morgue to investigate further that um, the body had been carrying thousands of dollars at the time, which would be millions of dollars in today's um, environment. And it went missing. And she decided to go um, forward and write that story under Ed's moniker. Um, and it ended up with them being pushed out of St. Paul because the police was trying to set them up. So that was one example where she pursued a story and she ended up having to write it under Ed's name because he was the one who was the person who was the reporter in the family at the time. And then the second one was in Philadelphia. Um, there was an exchange that I found in Billboard magazine, which was the industry publication at the time where there was a lot of dialogue um, between the, the roles that women could play in the news industry. And there was a man from NBC who said that women couldn't be broadcasters because they didn't have a strong enough voice and they didn't have enough stamina. And she rebutted that and said, you know, when I, when I lived in Ohio, I worked from two o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock in the morning. And sometimes I took on a third shift at 6 p.m. And I was an engineer and I was a reporter and I also was on the air. Um, and it's hard, I think, in today's society to think about those dialogues in the context and how, you know, unique 
um, a woman standing up for herself and being, you know, written about in, in that dialogue, because we would imagine that today, but it was very remarkable. Um, and there were just numerous instances of that over time. I think as obviously the story moved from the 30s to the 70s, it there was change, commensurate change along the way. Um, but she definitely had a, a, lo a longer and taller hill to climb um, than her husband and her peers. Um, and this story really comes about because Catherine notices something in GLAS that her male colleagues um, didn't. And she is the one who strikes up this relationship and this trust with GLAS. Why do you think she she noticed what others didn't? Why, why her? Yeah. Um, so she was the only female uh, reporter in a crew of about 14 international reporters in Belgrade. Um, it was January 1955, and everybody was there actually um, to cover another gentleman. So there were two co-defendants on trial, um, Milovan and then his friend Vladimir Dedeger. So Dedeger, small world that it is, was actually um, <clears throat> also a revolutionary and ended up in the same hospital in Italy during the war as Ed. So there was a there was a personal connection um, to Catherine and um, my great uncle and him, and also he was a journalist and so there was more affinity towards him as well, and so everybody was there really to kind of tell that story and uh, you know if you if you read the letters um, and the diaries that my great aunt wrote at the time you know everybody just said okay it's just Gios's time, but there was this moment on the steps where there was a crowd and this is very typical as I understand it in the time of. Um, the communist party members coming and trying to jostle and haggle the defendants before they go into the trial. And there's a moment where she watches members of the crowd spit on Gilas. And that just, that moment, I think just moved her and she was able to see kind of maybe more of a human side for lack of a better way to describe it. And that then led to subsequent events where she just wanted to help him. And then as she started helping him, she started seeing more of what he had to say. And it just became a domino effect of them working closer and closer together and developing a friendship. And, you know, it wasn't just the reporter and her source. It, it became truly, you know, a bond that lasted a lifetime. Uh, and you, you say in your book, and, and again, you mentioned this in, in your introduction, um, she and her husband become friends with Gilas and, and his wife. And one of the points in the story is in order to get the interviews, they come over to um, Ed and Catherine's house and Ed and Steffi, I believe is Gilas's wife's name. Um, and they're playing cards while Catherine and uh, Milovan are sitting down to have this interview and loud music is playing and um, and they're, they're running this water um, in order to be kept from being heard, um, you know, by, by bugs or anything like that. Um, is this kind of the normal trade craft at the time, you know, to, to avoid these bugs? Is this something that they just kind of intuitively know to do, or have they been coached to do this? I mean, how do you get this interview when, when you're in a communist country? Yeah. Um, so yes, I think there was a lot of mention of, you know, at, at the time and probably still today, when you live um, as an American in another country, there's the diplomatic set, there's the journalist set, and they, they end up, you know, coalescing because you're all expats in a country. And so she got the tip from her friends who worked at the embassy of how to do it. And they didn't anticipate that they were being watched um, themselves, but they knew Gilas's um, flat was bugged. Um, it was very, very well known. And he was even followed. And there were oftentimes secret police outside of his um, apartment building that haggled people on the street who they thought might be going to visit him. Um, and so I think that was just the way that you got around bugs was having loud noise. Uh, and it was not expected that they would end up getting secret police tales themselves. So Yugoslavia split from the Soviet Union in 1948 and they ended up continuing to have a relationship, but they almost forged their own path towards communism. So they were in this really interesting place between the West and the Soviet Union and quite frankly, played the two kind of entities off of one another at different times um, over the decades. 
Um, and so what was very unusual was by the time Ed and Catherine left and a large part of why they left the country is the secret police actually started following them. Um, and what was very interesting and made me chuckle, although I could imagine that Catherine at the time probably was perturbed by it was they didn't think she had anything to do with it. They th thought it was Ed the whole time. And so Ed was really kind of punished in a way for work that Catherine did um, because just no one could believe that a woman would have done what she ended up doing. It eventually caught up and they they figured out that she was part of it. But at the time they were laser focused on Ed and his editors at time just decided that they needed to get out of the country so he could do his job because he he couldn't meet with his sources for his stories. Um, I, I think that's so interesting. And it's actually one of the things that I wanted to ask you. You know, we, we talked so much um, about uh, Catherine and the challenges that she faced as being a woman at this time and in this male dominated world. But on the other side of that, it's kind of an advantage too, because, you know, she wasn't being watched. They didn't think that she was the one who was, you know, conducting these interviewing interviews and doing what she was doing. So, you know, there, there are kind of two sides to this coin is yes, it's a disadvantage um, because of the time and, you know, fighting for her place in the world, but it, it does also kind of prove to be one of the things that, that helped her as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I think one of one of the things that I enjoyed the most about um, the book as I was reading it is that the story is factual, but it reads like a spy thriller. And you open the book with this kind of heart pounding scene with Catherine hearing footsteps, thinking that she's being followed. Um, was the way that you set the book um, and then was the way that you set the book and the narration style, was, was that something that kind of naturally happened as you delved through the research and started writing? Um, or was it something that um, just kind of, um, you know, as you were going through this research, you thought this might be a good way to, to set the book up? Because it really does. I mean, you open with the scene and your heart gets pumping and you're, you're kind of afraid for her just within the first two pages of the book. Yeah. So, um, the short answer is I wrote a book that I would want to read and I didn't want to read a history textbook. Um, the longer answer is writing a book is a journey. Um, there were multiple different angles that um, I had to take. And, you know, when you write a book about history, one might think, oh, it's just about the, the sequence of events, but there is an art to writing a book. There are, you know, the, the different structures that you have to take. And so um, I think how I told it, definitely I experimented and I finally landed on, on what I did. Um, and I knew that I wanted to make it narrative nonfiction. Those were the books that I really enjoyed reading. And I wanted to kind of bring some color to what could be really dry, factual, you know, regurgitation if you didn't have some of the character development um, that, that was there. You just needed as a writer to kind of bring that more to the foreground. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's very effective. I mean, it, it just kind of reaches out and grabs you from from the very beginning, and you're kind of invested in the story because the the prologue really takes place about you know a little more than halfway through the book. So you're reading something that's happening within the first few pages that doesn't really happen in the book until you're about halfway through. So um, you know, as a reader, as somebody who's invested in the story, if you can be brought in immediately, I think that really that really helps, and you you certainly managed to do that within the first. Um, a few pages of the book, which I, you know, certainly appreciate. Um, but kind of getting back um, to, to Gilas, because I'm really kind of interested in this, this change that, that he undergoes in, in his thought process. And there's a revelation that he comes to, I think it's about a third of the way through the book. Um, and it really kind of struck me, especially when you understand he is a high ranking communist leader. He's the former vice president of Yugoslavia. I think he's an acquaintance of Joseph Stalin. Um, and it's this point when he's sitting down with Catherine and he says, well, I guess I no longer am, meaning he guesses that he's no longer a communist. And that's a pretty powerful realization for anyone, let alone someone of his standing within the Communist Party. Can you talk a little bit about this revelation and the consequences of this revelation and what it ultimately means for both him and Catherine? Yeah, I mean, Catherine, in one of the letters she writes to her editors and pitching why some of these articles that he's written should be um, published, the way she describes it is he basically fought his way out of communism. And in communism, there's this like dialectical thinking. 
And he truly was an intellectual first and foremost and played that role even throughout kind of the formation of Yugoslavia and the communist party in that country. And I think he just, I would imagine his brain just was processing lots of different ideas. And when the momentum of the revolution, the momentum of the war ended, and the kind of state building was beginning, and some of the uh, beliefs weren't coming into reality, um, he went to where he normally went, which was thinking and writing. And he was published. He worked on numerous articles um, right when she arrived in Belgrade in 1953 and published them over the course of you know several months. And um, it wasn't until he wrote a story um, about the wives of the Communist Party being mean to a friend of his wife um, that, you know, he really got people's attention. And then he gave an interview to the New York Times on the record and said some things about what he believed that got the West's readership attention. And it was those two moments that I think really prompted um, the trial and, and he and Dedeger were put on trial because Dedeger was supporting him in, in what he was thinking, were put on trial because they had spoken um, to the Western press. Um, and then it was just this momentum where he just kept on thinking and saying, and it was really remarkable again, because Yugoslavia was different. If this had happened in the Soviet Union, I'm not sure whether Gilas would have lived or not. Maybe he would have, but it was a it was a moment um, for me as a historian where the differences and the nuance between the different environments um, and where ideas could be kind of discussed. And he was certainly punished for what he said and did. Um, but it was a very interesting journey to kind of just research and see, and then to kind of think about you know what would have happened in another country. And then quite honestly, to think about what's going on in the world now mm -hmm. um, and, and how, how things might not have changed too much and how things might have changed. Mm -hmm. um, but I think he really believed deeply in what he felt and he felt it was his mission to say um, and get his ideas out there. And he had a son himself, he had a wife, he had a family, and he was willing to go to jail for what he believed because he felt so strongly about it. And he, I think is lucky that Catherine was able to get his ideas out and they were able to find a bigger platform um, as well so that more people were able to see um, what he thought and what he wrote about it. Um, and it was a very unique perspective, right? For the very reasons you mentioned, because it came from him. It wasn't an American writing about it. It was somebody who had been part of the creation of it and then was questioning it. Um, so let's talk about, you just kind of touched on it. Let's talk about getting this out of Yugoslavia. Um, you know, how, how does that happen? How does she smuggle? There, there are actually two manuscripts that, that she smuggles out. Um, and I, I believe it's the new class that winds up selling 3 million copies, I, I think you said. Um, but how, how do you smuggle out these manuscripts that are not, you know, it, it's, they're not short. Um, out of the country? And then how how do you go about finding a publisher to get this published? So there were a couple different ways that Westerners behind the Iron Curtain were able to get past censors. One was literally getting on a train and going to Trieste and having conversations from there um, to their publishers back in the US or in London or other cities. Um, but in order to get uh, articles out. She was very resourceful. She had friends who worked at the embassy, not just the American embassy, but other embassies. And when she found out that people were traveling out behind um, the Iron Curtain, she took advantage of that. So if people were going to Switzerland or Vienna or to Trieste, she had them take things and mail them for her from there so that uh, it would get past the censors. Um, and then towards the end, you know, in it's the, the episode that um, I began the book with in the prologue, um, she actually takes it out on her person um, because it's the second half of the new class. And she had the first half. And in working with the publisher, she realized that that part was missing. And she knows that she needs to get it out of the country. Um, and she ends up putting it on her body 
in order to make sure that it gets out of the country. Um, because when you go across the border, your bags can be searched, numerous things can happen. Um, so I think, um, you know, just resourceful and, um, you know, innovative in, in ways that, you know, only living in that time and living in that condition kind of engender. Um, and then as far as finding publishers, uh, she, I mentioned, she worked with her publishers to get some of his articles written while she was in Belgrade. And some of those articles actually um, prompted inbound queries to him from the US of various publishers. And so he had a couple of different offers. And so he had already made the decision that he wanted to work with several publishers. And then her job was just making sure that the, the papers made it to the right people. And then once she uncovered that half the manuscript was missing in one instance was tracking down the second half of it and making sure that the, the complete um, book was um, given to the right publishers. And then subsequently, she ended up having a journey with the publishers as the book uh, was written because one publisher in particular talked about how the book was smuggled out of the country. And that actually is great for publicity for the book, but terrible for GLOS and puts his life at risk because then it, it, um, it doesn't look good for the Communist Party and the government of Yugoslavia that this happened right under their noses. And so, again, if you think about perspective, you think about kind of the world and, and how um, just one statement can be interpreted in different ways. Um, I think she had that perspective that maybe the publishers in the US didn't, or they were just focused on the dollars that they could generate from the sales. Um, and this is a, a question that I have, and I, I'm noticing that this is a question that was just asked by, by one of our audience members as well, but there is a, a moment in the book where Catherine gets stopped at the Austrian border, um, and she has this, you know, on, on her person, what, what happens to her if she, if she gets caught? I mean, this, you know, you mentioned that there's a, a difference between Yugoslavia and the, and the Soviet Union at this time, um, and, you know, as an American, she's not really being followed, but she is smuggling these papers out and by Gila. So, so what happens to her if, if she's caught? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, we will never know because she wasn't caught. But I mean, it it is very likely that she would have created an international incident. Um, I don't know if she would have been killed, but she certainly um, could have faced jail time for an extensive period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it really like was risky. Um, for for very, very um, uh, moment in time. And I think she just decided to take the risk because she thought that the, the ideas were so important. Um, but she got lucky, very lucky. Uh, I, I think that's that's a big a big part of it too is is luck. <laughs> you know she's again, she's a woman. she's kind of unassuming they, they don't assume that women um, you know are, are going to be doing these kinds of things so you know luck also plays a big part of it which you know fortunate for us she was able to get them out as you said um i i do want to talk a little bit about um kind of the personal toll um that this line of work took on catherine and her family especially her son um you know you mentioned that um she and her husband you know had a baby their senior year of college um and you know, World War II happens, they're in Yugoslavia. Um, her son is mostly raised by his grandparents and she and her husband, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, um, are basically separated for a decade before they meet back up in, in Yugoslavia. So talk a little bit about this kind of personal toll that this line of work that she and her husband are in take on them and the, the kind of the family unit as a whole. Yeah, I think it was incredibly um, hard and I also think the way that everything came together um, put a lot of pressure on them as well. And so they were separated. In fact, one of the things that I could never get to the bottom of was whether they actually got divorced and then remarried or if they just separated. Um, but they you know, found themselves in the Great Depression in New York with a baby, with a job that Ed soon lost in Manhattan. And then they moved to upstate New York and lived a very hard life, moved to Minneapolis, and then moved to San Francisco. Um, a lot of that was because of the macroeconomic environment, but then in, in many ways, and Catherine kind of speaks to this a little bit, um, she felt that she had to give up 
work at um, at a formative time when she really wanted to be out covering things because she became a mother and they didn't have the wherewithal to have support for her to do that and have coverage. Because again, remember, women didn't really work outside the home during this time. Um, and my great grandparents, as my mom kind of, they were saints. They were saints on many levels for all of their children and um, grandchildren. And they did, they did raise um, um, their son um, for most of the part. I mean, they would come home on visits. He would travel to them. He went to boarding school once he got older. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that she really, um, believed so much in the work that she did, that work really was her priority over her family. Um, and that comes out in letters that she writes that comes out in diaries. Um, and I think there was tension and there still is today if we're all being honest about like how you prioritize and find that balance and today we have much more of a support system than she did back then um and we also have easier ways to get cross oceans and to connect to things so if she wanted to come back to the united states she took ships um planes weren't even you know that widely available there's there's a moment actually where Ed is given an opportunity to fly a Pan Am flight from Europe to the US. And it's definitely positioned as being a luxury. Um, and it's part of a press junket um, for him to go to New York. Um, so it wasn't fast to get to places and there wasn't the support system. And I think as part of the journey that she and Ed were on, they really worked um, after the war to get on the same equal footing. It didn't mean that the rest of society perceived it that way, but at least for them in their marriage, they agreed that Catherine was going to work and he was going to work. And he did um, look for opportunities to help support her and create opportunities for her um, in stories and, and in other things. Um, so when they ultimately um, leave Yugoslavia or urge to leave, um, what, what happens, you know, after they leave? Oh my goodness, so much. So, <laughs> the hit the highlights. <laughs> they, they leave and, um, you know, a revolution happens in Hungary and they go and, and they cover that. And I think that was a very formative experience for Catherine because she saw a lot of what Gilos had said and had thought really come to life. Um, they're in Eastern Europe for um, a good period of time. Uh, Ed has an opportunity to move to Asia and they move to Asia for a period of time. Um, and then they, they end up moving back to, to Eastern Europe um, because he has a falling out with an editor um, when he's in Asia. Um, but at that time, the secret police figure out that Catherine was part of um, the mix. It wasn't just Ed. And she's not allowed to come back into Yugoslavia for a period of time. Calls that she places don't go through because um, they know that they're coming from her. It doesn't mean she gives up trying to get through. And so she actually cre creates um, a, a, an ally in a woman named Stella Alexander who helps her kind of be um, still connected to the family because she travels in and out of the country and writes letters. And so, um, you know, her role changes um, for sure. Her direct connection um, with the family changes. And at the same time, she lost is in and out of prison for about 13 years as well. Um, so just not being able to have that direct connection with him um, is, is a different dynamic. Um, it doesn't mean she gives up. She looks for every opportunity she can to get his story out there, to make sure that the world is still paying attention to him and what he has to say. Um, but you know, the intimacy of the relationship definitely changes. Um, I do want to make sure to leave time for questions from the audience. And if you do have a question, please drop those into the Q and a box. Um, but I, I kind of want to end on, um, uh, on this note of you're diving into this research, you're researching a member of your family. Is there anything um, that surprised you um, as you were going through this research, any particular story or, or anything that kind of took you by surprise? I mean, I'll be honest with you, the entire story surprised me. So I was a history major and I knew nothing about any of this. Um, you know, upon reflection, I think the U.S. Uh, curriculum and history really focuses on World War One, World War II, and really kind of skips over the Cold War. Um, you learn about the space race, you learn about Potsdam, and you learn maybe about the Bay of Pigs, and that's about it. 
And so um, as I was going through this, um, I found a quote from Rudyard Kipling that really struck me. And it was basically, if history was told in stories, people wouldn't forget it. And I thought about that a lot as I was writing the story, as I was thinking about how to tell it from a narrative um, connection. I think there is so much that happened in the decades that covered the Cold War, both within Russia and outside. And I would love to learn more about you know, some of these untold stories. This is one of them. I can't imagine there aren't so many more. And so for me, it was just really surprising to kind of learn about all the nitty gritty nuances and differences um, about it. Because as you mentioned, the new class sold 3 million copies. In many ways, I kind of think about it as being the antithesis to Karl Marx's mm. Communist Manifesto. But we learn about Karl Marx and we don't learn about Milo von Gilas. And you know, I, I hope that that maybe as more stories are told and, and more is given to the, the breadth of the Cold War, that we have a better understanding because, you know, unfortunately history does repeat itself. And I think many things that happened during that time period are, you know, coming to bear in maybe different ways in the world today. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important that all of us as global citizens understand what came before so we can, you know, work to make the world a better place. Beautiful. Um, so we we have a question um, from a, a member of the audience who is a female Marine Corps veteran. Thank you so much for your service. Um, and also a master's student in the teaching of history program at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, and she's developed a high school level course on family genealogy that's centered on using National Archives military sources and census records to perform family history historiography. Um, so she's asking, and this kind of piggybacks a little bit on my last question, can you speak to the surprises that you encountered in your archival research and any tidbits you have that might delight and entertain high schoolers performing this sort of primary source research? Wow, that sounds incredible. I wish I had a class like that. In right? <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so I was very fortunate, as I mentioned, Catherine kept a lot of papers. She made sure not to keep them in Yugoslavia. She kept them in a storage facility in D.C., um, and then my great uncle donated them. So I had four of those big file size boxes in order to work through from primary documentation. Um, and then I was also fortunate that I could interview both my uncle and my aunt who had lived and worked and had stories to tell um, from their time. Um, but oftentimes there was some conflict in, in what they said, a little bit because of memory. I think Catherine changed some of her stories over time and just a little bit because they have memory and, you know, they, as they got older, you know, they remembered different things. Um, I, um, expanded, um, my search because they were journalists to really include their coverage. And so Ed wrote for time and I, I really brought in a lot of the color and the details to help with the narrative from those articles. And then the same thing for Catherine, she was a stringer for the Chicago Tribune. She ended up working for INS, which is a wire um, that is no longer in existence, but was really prominent at the time. And then worked for uh, Reader's Digest and Washington Post. And as part of that archive they left, they had reports that they wrote to their editors that might not have made it into the stories, but gave the color, or they had draft, um, articles that they wrote or they had interviews. And so those were like the two buckets um, that I really leaned into. And then I supplemented to the best of my abilities with other things, including the dozen books plus that Gilas wrote himself. Um, so um, if I were going about this um, without that, I think it would be really hard. Um, but being thoughtful about where you can maybe supplement and really get a sense of what the world is like. I, I really found reading the newspapers. I ordered a couple of life magazines from eBay to, to help me even see some of the ads, you know, seeing what the cars looked like at the time um, was helpful to just kind of immerse myself into what life was like um, and to make sure that the narrative was really in keeping with that. Yeah. So I guess the best tidbit is eBay and life magazines to kind of get um, a better sense of that the time period that you're doing research on. Um, so we we had a question too. Were you able to get into former Yugoslavian files to research? Do they do they even exist? I mean, this was you know a, a communist country. Were there files? Is there documentation? Were you able to access that? So I um, so I have traveled to all the um, countries that now comprise um, the 
um, former Yugoslavia. I did not do research there. I think had I tried to do research there, it would have been very hard because it would not have been in English. It would have been in the multiple languages um, that comprise um, those countries now. Um, so I really kind of, like I said, leveraged the, the archives that I had access to. And I, I don't speak Serbian. Um, and so that that's what I was um, with. There were a couple of letters from Gilas that were in Serbian. They were handwritten. And um, Ed and Catherine had translated them into English, um, which was was pretty neat because I wouldn't have been able to use them had I not had that translation. Um, I, I know it's kind of incredibly difficult, especially when you're talking about you know, a language that you don't speak or, you know, communist countries with the file keeping and, you know, kind of one sided, but, you know, having access or, or being able to have those letters where <clears throat> they've been translated are really invaluable for the for the research that you're doing to add color and flavor um, and accuracy to, to the story that you're telling. For um, sure. And there were a couple of times, I mean, there were a couple of mysteries that I never quite tracked down. One of them was whether they actually got divorced or they just separated. And so one of the neatest things that came out of this was um, uh, Milovan and Steffi have a son, Alexa, who lives actually in the apartment that he grew up in. Oh. And he and I became pen pals. <laughs> and he is a historian as well. And he wrote a book and I actually got connected to him through his publicist at Harvard Press. Um, and whenever I had a question and I wanted to say, Hey, I've got two competing things. This doesn't add up. What, what is your take or what is your perspective? Um, he would share what he, um, remembered. Um, and it was, it was really, it was really neat. Um, and I'm, I'm actually hoping that, um, now that the world has opened up a little bit after COVID of taking an entire family trip there to meet him in person, because he was so wonderful and helpful in, in helping track these things down. And in fact, supplied one of the pictures that I showed, um, in the slide earlier. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so we have, um, a, a question and, you know, I, my background is a history background. I know your background is a history background as well. And you did a, a lot of kind of this historical research to write this book. Um, and you mentioned reading through these boxes of documents, obtaining old life magazines, going through micro microfiche. You know, I, I have been in that situation before, um, but with so much of the world being digitized, do you feel that things um, will be lost to future historians because, you know, everything is so accessible online? Do you think there's something that will be lost by not going into these archives and doing this research kind of in, in the room itself. Um, so I actually thought about this a lot when I kind of was wrapping up the book. I do actually, because I think the art of letter writing has completely been lost. And the way we write emails is so much more casual than the way that we write letters. And I mean, I do this, I'm sure we all do this. I write texts and I use like, thank you with a U instead of a Y-O-U. And so, um, I think maybe to be optimistic, it will just be different. There will still be documentation. It will just be different types of documentation. But I do wonder at the depth of it all, because a lot of what was in the archives were just long, long letters of, I need to tell you about everything because I don't have email. I don't have the internet. I don't have the ability to just kind of like pick up the phone and, and call you. Um, and I think some of that will be lost because it's happening in phone calls or it's happening in texts. Um, but maybe it will open up opportunities for us to think about things differently as well on the, on the positive side. Um, so I have a question. This, this may be the final question, depending on, on how deep we get into it. But um, there's a, a question about um, women having to kind of reprove themselves every time they walk into a into the room or in a work environment, um, being told to be the smartest guy in the room to get people to listen. Um, and not every work setting or scenario really kind of allows that to happen. So what recommendations might you have for decreasing this time barrier that reproving oneself as a female often comes with in today's work environment? Um, so in other words, how can women close t the, this time gap of having to reprove oneself every time they show up? 
Wow. Yeah. Is, like I said, it's, it's a very weighty question. <laughs> that is a weighty question. I mean, I think there's so many different nuances and contexts in order to kind of answer that in, but, um, you know, at, at the core, I think in general for women and men, it's finding something that you believe in and kind of committing to it. Um, and thinking about how you build your own brand around that. And, um, so it's a, it's a intrinsic, you know, kind of motivation as coupled with like what you are known for. Um, and then hopefully through that, you know, your reputation, you know, precedes you, and then you're just able to go through the barriers and maybe you do just always have to kind of introduce yourself, remind people why you're there. Um, but knowing why you're there yourself and being true to yourself, as well as trying to kind of be consistent and showing up the same way. I think those have, those have certainly worked for me in the workplace. Um, I think you see those patterns working for Catherine. Um, she certainly faced numerous obstacles and constantly was having to say the same thing about who she was, but, um, that that's how I think about it. How do you think about it, Liz? I mean, I, I, I agree. I, I think it's, I think we've come a long way, certainly from, from where Catherine, you know, was in, in the forties and fifties, especially, you know, during the time period of this book, um, we have come a long way. And, and I think, you know, I think that's a testament to women and our resilience and our, and our strength. Um, I think we have a long way to go still. Um, and I, I think it's, um, uh, women are now, I think more willing to, give themselves a voice and stand up for themselves and, and willing to make themselves heard. Um, but, but I do think that there are still these kind of, um, even if it's an unconscious bias, there's this bias that exists, you know, in, in looking at women in the workplace. So, you know, it is, I think, probably a whole program that we could do just on this one topic. Um, but we, we have come such a long way. And I think we have to stand on the shoulders of women like um, like your great aunt and and the work that she did to kind of look to see how far we've come because of women like her. Um, so yeah, I think you know way more context to this than I than I think we have time to get into. But um, but good good question. You know, especially you know Women's History Month and International Women's Day to kind of think about uh, where we are and where we stand um, and how how we can do better and how we can. Um, how we can continue to make change and make ourselves heard. Um, so I, I'll do one final question just because this is a really fun question. Um, I think because this book reads so much like the spy thriller that you set out for it to do, um, it would make for a really great movie. Um, is there a, uh, who would you want to play your, your great aunt in, in the movie if it became a movie? Um, I got asked that question before, and I think the person who, um, as an actress, I mean, I, anyone, I would love for this to be a movie. I, I do hope that it will find its way to the screen somehow, some way. Um, but one of the actresses that I think embodies the character of Catherine, as well as happens to kind of look a little bit like her is Laura Dern. Oh, I could definitely see that. I think, um, Kate Blanchett kind of stood out for me, That's just, true. you know, kind of a, uh, you know, woman that I could see in this role too. So um, both really good options. So if anybody's listening, they can make this happen. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I want to thank you so very, very much um, for, for being here. I want to thank the Spy Museum um, for, um, you know, hosting this. Um, and on behalf of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, thank all of you for, for joining us. Um, thank you, Katie, so much for sharing your great aunt's story. Um, it is absolutely fascinating, wonderful to know these stories that have been hidden for so long and, and are coming to light. So um, thank you to our audience. Um, and just as a reminder, the program is being recorded. It will be up on the Spy Museum website and the Pritzker Military Museum and Library's website um, in the coming days. So be on the lookout for that. Um, but happy International Women's Day. Thank you again, Katie, for being with us. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.